Now we arrive at the arc that many fans, like me, consider to be the peak of So So No Freeran. Get ready for a masterpiece and be one of the early ones to know this story before it gets animated a few years from now and completely takes the anime fandom by storm. Let's get started. Set 30 years after Hiro Himmel's demise, the narrative unfolds in the Weiss region of the Northern Plateau. Furin's party is approached with an unusual request by the first-class mage Lernin. Initially hesitant, Freerin contemplates rejecting the proposal, wary of the complications that unofficial requests often entail. Fern observes Freerin's lack of enthusiasm, to which she admits her aversion towards Lernin. Stark recounts an incident where Lernin unexpectedly attacked Freerin, resulting in a shoulder injury. However, the inclusion of a grimoire as part of the request sways Freerin's decision, leading her to accept the task. Upon reaching El Dorado, they discover an expansive region transformed into gold, safeguarded by a potent anti-demon barrier. Fifty years prior, one of the Seven Sages of Destruction, known as Mocked of El Dorado, had converted the fortified city of Weiss and its inhabitants into gold. In response, the Continental Magic Association erected a barrier to contain Mocked, intending to imprison him until his natural death. To their surprise, the party encounters Dan Ken, who has assumed the role of Barrier Warden after achieving the status of a first-class mage. Daken shares his personal connection to the task, revealing that his hometown, located north of the fortified city of Weiss, was consumed by El Dorado years ago. He explains that despite Mocked being confined, his magic continues to seep beyond the barrier. Consequently, the responsibility falls on the first-class mage serving as the Barrier Warden to annually adjust its range, a duty that has persisted for the past five decades. Freerin acknowledges the strategy as a sensible one, noting she would have likely made a similar decision. When Denkin reveals he had ventured into El Dorado to visit his wife's grave, Freerin questions if he found solace in doing so. She firmly states that if his intentions involve confronting Mocht, they will not offer any support. Declaring they will refuse Lernan's request, she instructs Fern to return the grimoire. Fern and Stark are perplexed by Freerin's reluctance, contrast to her former enthusiasm for battling demons. Freerin, however, remains resolute, emphasizing her commitment to preserving life. She admits that Mocked is among the eleven mages who have bested her in combat, doubting her ability to defeat him. Freerin believes the most effective way to conquer Mocked is to keep him confined within the barrier until he succumbs to age. Denkin reflects on his initial belief that such containment would suffice. He admits he hadn't revisited his hometown since his wife's passing in his youth, using his responsibilities as a pretext to avoid confronting his past and the painful memories of happier times with his wife. His eventual decision to return wasn't driven by a desire to defeat Mocked or rescue his hometown but was a step towards releasing his attachment to his lost love. However, upon revisiting his hometown after 50 years, Dankin discovers it preserved as he remembered leading him to realize he had been evading the truth all along. Hearing Dinkin's heartfelt narrative, Freerin is reminded of a past conversation with Himmel about the flower bed making spell. She confesses to Himmel that she had refrained from using this spell for years, as it evoked memories of Flam, her deceased master. Freerin expresses her astonishment at finding solace in using the spell in Himmel in the hero party's presence, despite her previous reluctance. Himmel empathizes with her suggesting that her journey had been so arduous that she hadn't fully grasped the happiness she shared with her master. He reassures her that it's okay to fondly remember the joyful times from her past. In the present, Denkin informs Freerin and her companions that they are under no obligation to fulfill this request, explaining that Lernin's proposal stemmed from concern for him. He reveals his initial resolution to confront Mocked alone, determined to revive his hometown before his demise. He mentions he has gathered some leads towards a possible victory over Mocked. Reflecting on her own experiences and the wisdom imparted by Himmel, Freerin resolves to assist Denkin in his quest to create an opportunity for triumph against Mocked. Denkin guides Freerin and her companions to a dwelling designated for Barrier Wardens. He mentions that despite its readiness, most previous Wardens have chosen not to utilize it. Freerin concurs, noting that the proximity of the facility to both El Dorado and Mocked likely unnerves many mages. Inside, Fern displays signs of discomfort while sitting on a chair. Stark observes her pallor, which has been evident since their approach to El Dorado, and inquires about her well-being. 
Duncan expresses regret for not anticipating that the peculiar nature of El Dorado might be unsettling for most mages. Stark, seemingly unaffected, turns to Freeran for clarification. She acknowledges the comfort in having a warrior like Stark in such circumstances. Stark speculates whether the issue relates to mana, surmising that only mages would be sensitive to it. He wonders if Mokt is emitting a massive amount of mana, but Fern corrects him, stating the reality is quite the contrary. She reveals her inability to detect any mana emanating from El Dorado. Despite the strength of the barrier, she argues that Mokt's mana should still be perceptible at such a distance if his magic was responsible for transmuting such a vast area into gold. However, their mana detection fails to identify El Dorado as a magically transformed entity. Instead, it appears as a colossal mass of gold in its most unadulterated form. Freeran confirms Fern's observation, describing it as a foreboding phenomenon. Despite being a product of magic, it does not register as such. She delves into explaining Mokt's spell, Diagal's universal golden transmutation magic, which is capable of converting all material entities into gold. Stark reflects on curses as enigmatic and cryptic forms of magic typically wielded by demons and monsters. Dinkin further clarifies that only magic altering the state of living or non-living matter, such as inducing sleep, petrification, or transformation, is categorized as a curse. Stark hypothesizes that a priest capable of wielding goddess magic might dispel such a curse, but Dankin corrects him, indicating this is true only for standard curses. Freeran then sheds light on the grim reality that during the prolonged conflict with the Demon King army, Mokt's magic transformed numerous heroes in the northern countries, and not one has been restored. Diagals, impervious to even goddess magic, is thus deemed the most formidable curse. Mokt's reputation as the mightiest among the Seven Sages of Destruction stems not only from the irreversibility of his magic, but also because it bypasses defensive spells and evades detection, rendering it inescapable. Freeran concludes that their chances of victory against Mokt are non-existent. To mount any challenge against him, she insists that they must enlist Ciri's assistance. At this juncture, Duncan interjects, eager to share the intelligence he has gathered. He explains that the former Barrier Warden, First Class Mage Lernan, undertook an investigation within El Dorado. The findings were conveyed through the memories of his partner, Second Class Mage Edel. As Duncan begins to elaborate, Freeran intervenes, insisting he cut to the conclusion first. Simultaneously, Lernan and Edel are traveling in a carriage back to Oysterst after delivering their findings to Dankin near El Dorado. Edel, fatigued and resting against the carriage, voices her exhaustion from the El Dorado investigation. Lernan reassures her that they will soon reach Oysterst and emphasizes the value of their intel in aiding Dankin. Edel, noting Lernan's unusual support for Dankin, queries the reason behind it. Lernan admits it's a long tale. But at Edel's insistence, given their ample time until reaching Oysterst, he begins to share his backstory with Dankin. Lernan recounts his younger days with Dankin, where both served as mages in the Imperial military. Despite their differing personalities, they formed a strong bond and enjoyed their collaborative work. However, Lernan's lack of social skills led to his expulsion from the military, despite his evident talents. Dankin remained steadfastly supportive of him through this ordeal. This unwavering loyalty left Lernan feeling a deep sense of gratitude and indebtedness, leading him to vow that he would one day repay Dinkin's kindness. The first-class mage, Lernan, continued, extolling Dinkin for his fervor, enthusiasm, and profound dedication to his wife. He reminisced about times when Dinkin would speak of his wife with an affectionate yet pained smile. Lernan remembered that even following his wife's death, Dinkin would still bring her up, along with his intentions to revisit his hometown. Lernan reflected on the sense of nostalgia these memories evoked, noting how, as time progressed, Dankin ceased mentioning his plans to return home. In fact, Dankin had not visited his hometown for over 50 years. This prolonged absence was finally broken when Lernan relayed the news that Duncan's hometown had been swallowed by El Dorado, prompting Dankin to make the long-delayed journey back. Lernan concluded that his extensive efforts to aid Dan Kin stemmed from a desire to help him reconnect with his true hometown, not the present day, gold transmuted El Dorado. Following a shared moment of silence, Lernan inquired of Edel if they were too late in their endeavors. Edel, agreeing, noted the excessive passage of time. 
Lernan shared this sentiment, understanding yet regretting Dinkin's delay. He reflected on their younger days, acknowledging their failure to embrace a simple truth. As humans, their lifetimes are finite, and one day is not a guaranteed point in their existence. He confessed his own postponement in assisting Dinkin over the past 50 years and saw the current situation as a final chance to fulfill his long-standing debt. Lernan viewed this as his last endeavor as an aging man, hoping to witness Dinkin engage in a grand, heroic battle beyond his own reach. Meanwhile, back in the cabin designated for El Dorado's barrier warden, Dinkin complied with Freeran's insistence to present the conclusion first, revealing the impossibility of defeating Mott. Freeran, accepting this outcome, suggested closing the case. However, Stark, eager to understand the full context, urged Freeran to listen to the entire narrative. Dinkin concedes that defeating Mott is improbable, yet he also believes that under current conditions, their defeat is equally unlikely. He aims to explore potential strategies for victory using the information he has collected. Freeran questions Dinkin's assertion that they are unlikely to lose. Dinkin alludes to his own survival after encountering Mokht in the Golden Land, where he visited his wife's grave. Given Mokht's extensive mana detection throughout the Golden Land, Mokht indeed confronted Dinkin but chose not to harm him. Dinkin suspects that Mokht currently has no intention to kill him. Freeran, curious, probes further, sensing Dinkin's confidence as if he has personal knowledge of Mokht. Dinkin expresses a desire to narrate his story from the beginning, acknowledging the complexity of the circumstances. He decides to start with the present state of the Golden Land in Mokht. Dinkin recounts that the Continental Magic Association encapsulated Mokht and the fortified city of Weiss within a barrier 50 years ago. Since then, their approach has been passive, limited to barrier maintenance. Duncan's friend Lernan then embarked on a personal quest to probe the Golden Land's interior. Dinkin received the findings of this mission through Edel, a second-class mage. As Dinkin relays this information, the memory transfer begins with Edel's interaction with La Wine and Ken discussing bakery products. Stark, growing impatient, questions the relevance of this detail. Freeran explains that memory transfer, being an intricate spell, often starts with scenes that made a significant impact on the caster, making it challenging to isolate specific parts. Nonetheless, Freeran concurs that commencing the narrative from this point is unnecessary. Returning to the memory, Lernan offers Edel a charmingly shaped bread, joking about its trivial cost compared to the fees he owes her family. Edel sighs, referencing another task from the Continental Magic Association, but Lernan clarifies it's a personal request. Despite Edel's reluctance, Lernan insists, noting her unparalleled expertise in hypnosis among first-class mages. Edel suggests method, but Lernan dismisses her as less proficient. Curious, Edel inquires about the task's nature, learning it involves the Golden Land. Edel, intrigued, asks if she can assist, aware that her hypnosis is ineffective on non-human targets. Lernan acknowledges this limitation but explains that's not the assistance he seeks. Lernan then shows Edel the Stone Bracelet of Servitude, a unique magical item capable of controlling a demon's mind, crafted by you of the Sage. He holds a replica, explaining its history of misuse, particularly in the case of Mokht of the Golden Land. Mokht, known for his gold transmutation magic, was controlled by the Lord of Weiss using the bracelet. In rebellion, Mokht doomed Weiss, transmuting it to gold. Survivor accounts indicate that Mokht continues to wear the bracelet, but it is suspected to be malfunctioning. Lernan presents the replica to Edel, believing her hypnosis expertise might help decipher its magical structure. He hopes restoring the bracelet's power on Mokht could be key to defeating him. Edel, feeling the weight of the task, questions Lernan's plan should she fail. Lernan admits his survival strategy has always been knowing when to retreat. With this understanding, they journey towards the Golden Land. Lernan reveals that his team, led by Tao, a young yet elite first-class mage with extensive combat experience in the Northern Plateau, had already entered the Golden Land for an initial investigation. Accompanying Tao are several second-class mages, many of whom possess more experience than Tao. Lernan is confident that this team will return with valuable insights. During their journey towards the Golden Land, Lernan encounters Fra, one of the mages from the team. Fra reports a brief but fatal encounter with Mokht within the Golden Land, where Mokht effortlessly overpowered them, giving no opportunity for the mages to retaliate. 
Tragically, the rest of the team were killed, and Fur believes her survival is solely due to her swift escape. Learn and ponders why Mokht spared her life. Suddenly, Fur begins to turn into gold. Learn and urgently commands Edel to extract Fru's memories, but they are too late. Fru is completely transformed before they can act. Learnin is remorseful for Fru's agonizing fate and interprets Mokht's decision to let her go as a warning to others. Feeling underestimated by Mokht's actions, Learnin is determined to venture into the Golden Land himself. Upon arriving at the edge, Edel notices a powerful spell that obscures perception, rendering the barrier invisible to the average person. Learnin explains that the Golden Land's allure could captivate anyone's attention and awaken their greed. The nearby villages have long been abandoned, and now, the location of the fortress city of Weiss is almost forgotten. Learnin acknowledges that despite the barrier being designed to deter demons, it isn't foolproof against human intrusion. However, they cannot be held accountable for individuals who, driven by greed, breach the spell and seldom return alive. He picks up a golden apple, remarking on the chaos that would ensue if the gold from the Golden Land were to be circulated. He notes a peculiar characteristic of mocked transmuted gold, it's indestructible and unchangeable, regardless of heat or force applied. Though it appears as gold through magical analysis, it is, in fact, an entirely different substance. As they progress, Lernan points out that only one settlement remains in the region. He wishes for Edel to meet someone before entering the Golden Land. They meet an elderly man who once served the Gluck family, Lords of Weiss. He is one of the few survivors, having been away on an errand when Weiss was transformed into gold. Though he wasn't directly involved in the incident, Lernan hopes his knowledge about Mokht can provide valuable insights. Lernan was concerned about the aged man's fading memories. She assured him that the man had consented to share his memories, as long as they were used to aid in the salvation of Weiss. Edel initiated the memory reading by asking the man about his tenure as a servant, learning he had worked there for 20 years. Concerned about the vastness of the information, Edel requested him to focus on a specific event. Lernan interjected, mentioning the incident 60 years ago when the Lord of Weiss placed the stone bracelet of servitude on Mokht. Using this as a reference, Edel delved into the man's memories. She witnessed the Lord of Weiss commanding Mokht to serve the people of the fortress city of Weiss and their descendants, forbidding any malicious actions towards them. The command included a self-destruct clause should Mokht harbor any ill intentions towards the people of Weiss. Edel was taken aback by this revelation and conveyed to them that Mokht's instructions were vague, merely prohibiting malicious acts. The old man inquired if this posed a problem. Edel responded that this would have been straightforward if they were dealing with a human. Stepping outside, Edel beckoned Lernan to proceed towards the Golden Land. Before leaving, she posed one final question to the man. What exactly did the Lord of Weiss want from Mokht initially? The elderly man confirmed that the Lord of Weiss's objective was the acquisition of immense wealth. Subsequently, Edel and Lernan ventured into the Golden Land. Edel pondered the oddity of using Mok to amass wealth, questioning its feasibility since gold that couldn't be processed would be easily identified as counterfeit. Edel reflected on gold's enduring value, pointing out that its worth is universally recognized because it can be repurposed, regardless of its country of origin. Whether transformed into jewelry or new currency, gold maintains its value due to its rarity and ease of processing. In contrast, gold that cannot be processed is essentially valueless, akin to sand masquerading as salt. She suspected an undiscovered motive behind the Lord's actions. Upon entering, they were confronted by a grim scene of corpses, some of whom learn and recognized as colleagues and others as adventurers who trespassed into the Golden Land. Suddenly, Mokht appeared, expressing regret that their presence necessitated adding two more corpses to the scene. Lernan detected a hint of reluctance in Mokht's voice, to which Mokht confessed his aversion to conflict. He revealed his practice of creating statues from those he killed brutally, deterring further intrusions. Mokht, ready to attack, declared them daredevils for disturbing his peace. As Mokht unleashed his sword, Lernan effectively countered the assault. Amidst the combat, Lernan expressed a sense of honor at being labeled a daredevil by Mokht, considering it the highest praise he had ever received. In the midst of their intense battle, Lernan called on Edel to perform her task. She confirmed she could still analyze and potentially restore the stone bracelet of servitude from a distance, but the time required would vary based on the extent of restoration needed. 
learn and prepared for a prolonged engagement, eager for the fight. As Macht aggressively confronted Lernan, the latter adeptly dodged, seizing the opportunity to counterattack. Lernan surmised that Macht was more focused on setting an example than quickly transforming him into gold, indicating he didn't perceive Lernan as a serious threat. Their clash continued with Lernan skillfully buying time, despite not being a magic expert. Macht grew increasingly irritated with Lernan's resilience and non-lethal approach, suspecting an ulterior motive behind their actions. Upon realizing they aimed to repair the stone bracelet of servitude, Mach declared their efforts futile. Edel then conveyed to Lernan that the bracelet was functioning correctly, and the hypnosis spell on Mach remained effective. Lernan was shocked, finding it inconceivable for Mach to transmute the city and its inhabitants into gold without any malicious intent. He sought Edel's perspective on this matter. Mach interjected, stating that demons lack the concept of malice and are incapable of experiencing emotions that are foreign to their nature. Edel elaborated, explaining that demons, originally monsters, instinctively deceive and prey on humans. For them, harming humans is an innate drive, not motivated by emotional reasoning. Edel highlighted the fundamental difference between demons and humans, noting that demons don't possess malice in their actions, as these actions are as instinctive to them as sleeping or eating is to humans. She clarified that demons don't require malice, rendering the situation more complex for Lernan. Understanding the challenging situation, Lernan inquired if Edel could modify the stone bracelet's command. However, Edel explained that only the bracelet's original user could add commands. As their discussion concluded, Macht asked if they had finished strategizing. Lernan acknowledged their plan to retreat, emphasizing that their primary objective was information gathering, though he had hoped for a fortunate victory over Macht. He candidly admitted his preference for operating behind the scenes, likening himself to a coward. Lernan then activated a golem contained in a bottle, entrusting the immediate battle to it while he focused on information collection. He assured Macht of his return, determined not to cease his efforts until Macht revealed his strategies. Macht, unimpressed, swiftly destroyed the golem, also injuring Lernan in the process. Despite the intense battle, Edel courageously continued her task, managing to touch Macht and access his memories before collapsing from the overwhelming experience. As the golem assisted the unconscious Edel, Macht expressed surprise at her ability to read his memories. Lernan, Realizing they had accomplished their goal, declared there was no longer a need to return to the Golden Land. He commended Edel for her exceptional performance and bravery, acknowledging that they had successfully gathered all the necessary information. From a bottle, another creature appeared, providing Lernan and his team an opportunity to make their escape. Back with Freerin and her group, Freerin expressed her admiration for Edel's remarkable skills in hypnosis magic, given her ability to access Mach's memories. Stark, curious about the significance of this feat, asked if it was indeed noteworthy. Freerin clarified that delving into a demon's mental structure, which is vastly different from a human's, to sift through their memories is an extraordinarily challenging task. She believed Edel must have endured severe pain during the process due to the complexity involved. As evening approached, Duncan indicated that it was time for him to attend to some matters, after which he would share more about Mott's memories. Intrigued, Freerin inquired about his plans. Duncan revealed that he had been visiting the Golden Land daily to engage in conversations with the demon, Mott of the Golden Land. He admitted that it might seem like a futile endeavor, but he had been persistently pursuing these discussions, even if it meant merely grasping at straws. Dankin disclosed that he hailed from the fortified city of Weiss, a place known for its modest population. Recalling the two commands bound to Macht via the stone bracelet of sovereignty, to serve the people of Weiss and their descendants, and to refrain from malicious acts against them, the group pondered the implications. Despite Macht's demonic nature, leaving him unable to comprehend malice, the command to serve remained effective. This insight led Freerin to surmise why Duncan could venture into El Dorado unharmed and speculated whether Macht might heed Duncan's directives. Freerin, however, remained skeptical about the advantage of this situation, a sentiment echoed by Duncan. He acknowledged Macht's indifference to forceful demands, despite the demon posing no threat to him. Freerin inquired about Duncan's persistence in engaging in what seemed like futile dialogue with a demon. Duncan expressed his deep desire to reclaim his homeland. He emphasized that Macht's magic, 
Diagals would continue to affect El Dorado even after Mach's demise. As a result, the only way to reverse El Dorado's gold transmutation was through Mach himself. Denkin revealed Mach's awareness of his life's significance and his unwillingness to restore El Dorado, creating a deadlock where keeping Mach alive became imperative for Duncan's objective. As Denkin prepared to depart for El Dorado, Freerin expressed her desire to accompany him. Denkin informed her that while Mach wouldn't harm her if introduced as his friend, he couldn't guarantee it. Undeterred, Freerin insisted on going arguing it was more productive than continuing feudal discussions and that she sought to verify something. Upon learning of this, Fern and Stark volunteered to join, with Stark confidently stating his ability to flee and rescue them if necessary. Before their encounter with Mokht, Freerin cautioned them that their purpose was merely conversation but preemptively apologized for any unforeseen issues. Upon arriving at the fortified city of Weiss, the party encountered Mokht waiting by the gate who received them with due respect. Entering the mansion, Mokht inquired about the new visitors. Denkin introduced them as his friends and instructed Mokht to treat them courteously. Mokht complied and greeted them with politeness, referring to himself as the magic instructor of the Gluck family. Freerin responded, noting that they had met 600 years prior when she had battled him. Mokht showed no recognition of their previous encounter, prompting Freerin to escalate the situation by challenging him to a battle. However, before Mokht could react, Denkin intervened, commanding him to refrain from engaging. In the living room, Mokht served tea to the group, mentioning that he had preserved the tea set because Lord Gluck, his former master, was fond of it. He questioned Freerin about her intentions for visiting him, to which she admitted they couldn't defeat him, yet he wasn't entirely flawless. Mokht, intrigued by this provocation, inquired Denkin about Freerin's identity. Learning she was the mage from the party that defeated the Demon King, Mokht noted Duncan's past interest in the hero party's adventures. When Freerin questioned if Mokht sought revenge for the Demon King, he surprisingly expressed indifference towards the Demon King army, claiming he had always advocated for coexistence with humans, even before being controlled by the Stone Bracelet of Sovereignty. Freerin was skeptical, but Mokht maintained his stance, confirmed by Denkin who had accessed his memories. Freerin expressed frustration over Mokht's refusal to reverse El Dorado's curse and his continued killing, challenging his alleged desire for coexistence. Mokht's response to her questioning revealed a fundamental disconnect between their species' understanding. After the tense discussion, the party, led by Denkin, left Mokht's presence unharmed. Freerin inquired about Duncan's seemingly close relationship with Mokht, to which Denkin disclosed that Mokht was previously a magic instructor for the Gluck family the rulers of Weiss, and had once taught Denkin as well. Denkin recounted that Mokht was his tutor in magic from an early age, noting Mokht's rare ability as a demon to wield human magic. Upon learning Denkin's age was 78, Freerin deduced a discrepancy in the timeline since Mokht had been under the bracelet's influence for about 60 years. Denkin clarified that Mokht had served the Gluck family, the lords of Weiss, for over 80 years, predating his subjugation by the bracelet. Mokht had reportedly always shown a friendly disposition towards humans, consistently following the feudal lord's directives. Denkin once believed the bracelet's control was superfluous. Prodded by Denkin to share her findings from their meeting with Mokht, Freerin avoided a direct answer, merely reiterating Mokht's invincibility. Pressed further, she expressed her lack of confidence, doubting any real chance of victory against Mokht. Turning the conversation, Freerin questioned Denkin about any winning strategies he might have discerned from Mokht's memories. Denkin revealed he hadn't fully processed the memories, which spanned over a century, due to their vastness. Commending Edel's expertise in mental magic once more, Freerin offered to assist Denkin in sifting through and interpreting Mokht's extensive memories. In El Dorado's mansion, Mokht reflected on his recent dialogue, acknowledging that Freerin had raised a compelling question. He saw her query as pivotal in shaping his future interactions with humans. Mokht openly invited Freerin to delve into his memories, challenging her to a metaphorical battle for coexistence and eager for her to unveil the answer he sought. Mokht's memories drifted to the first time humans captivated his interest. This occurred while he was executing a typical extermination of a human settlement by the Demon King's orders. A village bishop, perceiving something unique in Mokht, expressed sympathy for his existence. After ending the bishop's life, 
Macht found himself grappling with self-doubt, recognizing his familiarity with words, but not the emotions they conveyed. Observing the aftermath of the battle, Mach could identify feelings like fear, anger, sorrow, and intent to kill, but concepts like malice or guilt remained elusive to him. This realization spurred his curiosity about humans. Confronting two orphaned children, Mach presented them with a grim choice, fight each other to the death with the survivor promised life. As he watched the ensuing struggle, Mach acknowledged a newfound sentiment within himself. He labeled this feeling as favor, realizing he had developed a fondness for humans. Mocked, after obliterating a human settlement in the northern countries, didn't experience any new emotions. He sensed an ambush attempt and warned the assailant that finding a vulnerability in him was futile. The challenger was Warhide, one of the northern country's three great knights. Mocked, feeling he had overstayed in the region, lamented humans sending such persistent foes after him. Despite Mocked's warning, Warhide, Adhering to the Emperor's mandate to eliminate the Demon King army's remnants, engaged Mokht with a barrage of arrows. During the battle, Mokht used his sword for defense. Warhide, amidst the combat, shared his theory that Mokht's unique magic, Diagals, must have intricate prerequisites for its use since not all villages Mokht attacked turned to gold. This notion amused Mokht, who scorned the idea of needing specific activation conditions for his magic. He questioned if humans always ponder over such complexities when casting spells, contrasting this with demons' perception of magic use as an innate, almost reflexive action, akin to moving one's limbs. Mach then clarified there were no such conditions for his magic, and he could end any battle instantly if he chose to. To prove his point, he abruptly transformed Warhide into gold, showcasing the effortless potency of his magic. Warhide, stunned by the turn of events, couldn't fully articulate his query on why Mach didn't consistently use his magic. Mocked, nonetheless, provided an answer, it was simply monotonous. His magic was excessively potent, rendering most confrontations trivial. Mocked questioned Warhide if such overwhelming power could genuinely constitute a battle or if it held any semblance of enjoyment. Without waiting for Warhide's response, Mach departed, expressing his aversion to such one-sided conflicts. Elsewhere, on a shoreline, Mocked encountered Solitaire, a female demon devoted to studying humans. She was analyzing a beached orca. Solitaire introduced herself and extended a handshake, a gesture Mocked either misunderstood or intentionally ignored, opting instead to examine the orca's carcass. Referring to the orca as a fish, Solitaire concurred, albeit acknowledging it only resembled one. Subsequently, Solitaire escorted Mach to a facility she had converted from human use, showcasing skeletal remains of a shark and an orca. She posed a question to Mach, of the two skeletons, only one truly belonged to a fish. She inquired if Mach was familiar with convergent evolution. Receiving a negative response, Solitaire elucidated that orcas, despite their aquatic nature and fish-like appearance, originated from land-dwelling ancestors. Over centuries, they adapted to life underwater, morphing into a form akin to fish. Yet, internally, orcas remained mammals, fundamentally distinct from fish. Solitor, inviting Mach to tea, dismissed his queries about the emotions of malice and guilt as inconsequential. She argued that if demons were affected emotionally every time they deceived humans, their species would have ceased to exist. Mach, struggling to comprehend, prompted further explanation from Solitor. She clarified that the similarities between humans and demons, their appearance, communicative abilities, and seemingly human behaviors, were merely tools for deception and predation. Consequently, demons could never truly grasp human emotions, much like one cannot fathom the sentiments of an airborne insect. Solitaire emphasized the futility of Mach's contemplation on such matters. However, Mach remained undaunted, asserting that he had ample time to ponder and believe that understanding human emotions was key to achieving coexistence. This perspective intrigued Solitaire. In a different scenario, amidst the ruins of another village devastated by Mokt, he encountered Schlacht, the Demon King's prophetic right hand. Schlacht suggested a collaboration to defeat the Hero of the South. Mokt's reaction to this proposal seemed hesitant. After Schlack's proposition, Macht initially refused, expressing reluctance to risk his life for the Demon King and questioning Schlack's intention to involve him in feudal warfare. Schlack, highlighting Macht's aversion to conflict, 
nevertheless insisted on compliance due to the Demon King's command. When Mach challenged Schlacht's ability to enforce the order, Schlacht responded with a counter-challenge, questioning Mach's ability to resist. Their tense exchange escalated into a silent standoff, which Schlacht eventually diffused, admitting his reluctance to eliminate Macht. Macht, acknowledging the significance of Schlacht's request, especially given Schlacht's foresight abilities, conceded to consider the matter. Macht recognized the strategic importance of another Sage of Destruction, the so-called Miraculous Grousum, whom he viewed as a formidable adversary. Expressing his frustration at being manipulated by Schlacht's schemes, Macht inquired about his role in the upcoming conflict. Schlacht reassured him that victory was within reach, as foreseen in multiple visions of the future. Macht, skeptical, suggested that a deadlock was the most favorable outcome, implying that Schlacht's fate was uncertain. The exchange concluded with Schlacht sitting beside Macht, contemplating his own mortality and the unpredictability of the future. Schlacht revealed that he had instructed Grousum to erase Macht's memories of an impending battle. He reprimanded Macht for a lapse in judgment that allowed others to access these memories. Addressing Freerin through Macht's recollections, Schlacht disclosed that he obliterated Macht's memories to conceal the specifics of a crucial battle against the Hero of the South, a conflict he deemed vital for the survival of demons. Resonating even a millennium later, Confused, Macht listened as Schlacht hinted at a narrative meant for future understanding before departing. Macht expressed concern for Schlacht's well-being, to which Schlacht responded with weariness, having heard similar sentiments repeatedly. In a leap forward in time, Macht, in the northern plateau, engaged in the senseless slaughter of humans, a departure from his typical behavior. He orchestrated a situation where two childhood friends were forced into mortal combat, with the promise of sparing the victor. Macht observed the surviving boy weeping over his deed, having slain a non-resistant friend. Intrigued by the boy's grief, Macht pressed for an explanation of his feelings, seeking to comprehend the emotion of guilt. The boy, incensed by Macht's insensitivity, confronted him, leading to his own demise at Macht's hands. Macht thanked the boy for enlightening him on the concept of guilt arising from harming those close to them. This revelation led Mach to ponder if he could experience similar emotions and prompted his journey towards the fortified city of Weiss, a densely populated human settlement in the northern plateau. In search of relationships that might evoke these human-like emotions, Mach recounts an incident where he impulsively attacked a nobleman's carriage en route to the fortified city of Weiss. The nobleman, Gluck, the feudal lord of Weiss, witnessed Mach effortlessly eliminate his guards. Surprised, Gluck remarked on the unexpected defeat of his skilled subordinates, prompting Mach to question if they were trained in human combat. Gluck pondered if such training was detrimental, to which Mach explained that those accustomed to fighting humans struggled against demons due to differences in physical abilities and reaction speeds. Gluck absorbed this insight and then inquired about what it would take for Mach to kill him. Reaching into his jacket, Gluck's action alarmed Mach, who defensively positioned his sword near Gluck's neck. Unfazed, Gluck merely retrieved a cigarette box, requesting a final smoke before his potential demise. Mocked, observing Gluck's composed demeanor, remarked that while he didn't seem like a killer, his eyes betrayed his murderous history. Gluck confessed to ordering the deaths of numerous political adversaries, although he considered them more reprehensible than himself. He admitted to feeling burdened by guilt for his actions. This confession intrigued Mocked, who shared his ongoing quest to understand human emotions, particularly the feelings of guilt and malice that seemed so elusive to him. Gluck thoughtfully questioned Mocked about his understanding of moral concepts like good and evil. Mocked's inability to grasp these notions prompted Gluck to reflect on the seemingly simpler nature of the demon's existence. He then delved into an account of Weiss's troubled history. Weiss, he explained, was a haven for disgraced nobles from the imperial city, who perpetuated their power struggles and undermined the city's governance for personal gain. Although he was the nominal ruler, real control lay with a rival noble family and their allies, who exploited the city and its people for their own enrichment. Gluck acknowledged his inaction towards these injustices, even after his son, who had bravely called for reform, was murdered and his death disguised as a suicide. Gluck's subsequent decision to orchestrate the deaths of others made him realize the ease and ruthlessness of such actions. Mock queried whether Gluck sought revenge for his son, a concept he seemed to comprehend. 
While Gluck partially affirmed this, he emphasized his primary motivation was fulfilling his son's vision for a better Weiss. As Gluck's cigarette extinguished, he revealed the purpose of his conversation with Macht, a negotiation. He proposed to teach Macht about the human emotions he sought to understand, particularly malice. In exchange, he wanted Macht's help in eliminating his crafty and well-protected political adversaries, using his unique demonic abilities. Gluck portrayed these opponents as guarded by individuals skilled in lethal combat against humans. Macht agreed to Gluck's proposition and swiftly eliminated the members of the rival noble family that held de facto control over Weiss within six months. When one of the surviving nobles confronted Gluck about the mysterious deaths, Gluck feigned innocence, offering to assist in the investigation. As the noble expressed skepticism, Gluck pointedly recalled a similar reaction from this noble when Gluck's own son had died, insinuating the current situation mirrored that past event. He then casually dismissed the noble, advising him to take precautions like locking his door at night. Later, standing on his mansion's balcony with Macht beside him, Gluck revealed his intention to employ Macht in a more public role in the administration of Weiss. Initially, Macht responded briskly, prompting Gluck to emphasize his authority as the feudal lord. Subsequently, Macht's demeanor shifted, adopting a more subservient tone as he addressed Gluck as his master, reflecting his newfound role in the service of the city's ruler. Overlooking the city of Weiss from a balcony, Macht inquired about his new public role while serving tea to Gluck. Gluck began the conversation by mentioning the Demon King's defeat by hero Himmel, noting Macht's indifferent reaction. Macht, pouring tea, expressed that he had no particular feelings about the Demon King's downfall. Gluck then revealed his plan to publicly introduce Macht as the personal mage of the Gluck family, symbolizing the dawn of a peaceful era in Weiss. Curious, Macht asked why, leading Gluck to question if demons commonly enjoyed tea. Macht explained he was merely mimicking human behavior. Gluck, intrigued by Macht's choice of tea, learned it was a favorite of his late wife, commenting on Macht's adeptness at human social nuances. He observed that demons, including Macht, possess a natural ability to deceive and win the trust of humans, often without deliberate intention. Gluck intended to leverage this demonic trait, using Macht's aptitude for manipulation in handling the city's nobility, aiming to secure alliances with other influential families in Weiss. Gluck emphasized to Mach that forming alliances was crucial and resorting to murder should only be a last measure. Sipping his tea, Gluck shifted the conversation, labeling it as evil. Mach admitted his inability to grasp the concept of evil, acknowledging only that Gluck appeared to be enjoying himself. Gluck noted Mach's apparent enjoyment as well and remarked that Mach, being a monster ignorant of justice and evil, would be guided by him to learn these concepts. Gluck promised to teach Macht what constituted just actions versus evil once, with the expectation that Macht would one day comprehend these concepts on his own. Curious, Macht queried about the outcome if he failed to understand. Gluck thoughtfully responded that he would remain by Macht's side, aiding his understanding, even if it meant venturing to hell's depths. Macht then inquired if Gluck had a contingency plan to eliminate him after securing control over Weiss, to which Gluck, intrigued, asked Macht's thoughts on the matter. Macht expressed his anticipation. Subsequently, Macht was formally introduced to the Weiss populace. He engaged with the nobility in various social activities, such as accompanying them in scholarly pursuits, playing chess, attending social gatherings, horse riding, and serving tea during their visits to Gluck. Over time, Macht earned recognition and some level of appreciation from the nobles, although they remained cautious and fully trusting him. At one occasion, the Weiss nobility convened with Macht, questioning his decision to reside among humans in their city. Macht presented an ostensibly utopian rationale, asserting his belief that dialogue and cohabitation represented the initial steps towards harmony between demons and humans. The nobles commended his viewpoint, expressing a desire for more demons to emulate his amicability. They expressed a willingness to trust Macht and inquired if he would commit to defending Weiss. During this exchange, Gluck made his entrance, prompting Mach to exit the assembly to accompany him. Gluck mentioned a predicament, to which Mach agreed, noting the intrusion of adversaries within his mana detection range. Gluck, finding Mach's choice of words amusing, revealed that remnants of the Demon King's army were advancing towards Weiss. He queried Mach about the nobles' intentions. Mach relayed their loyalty test, 
eliciting laughter from Gluck who ridiculed the concept, affirming that Macht inherently lacked any sense of allegiance. Macht responded to this with a mere smile, and Gluck commanded him to annihilate all of Weiss's foes, asserting that annihilating his kin should be facile for Macht, given his absence of loyalty. Fulfilling Gluck's directive, Macht single-handedly obliterated the encroaching demon forces. Amid the dissipating remains of his demon counterparts, Macht recognized one as Shogun Shrag, the lightning flash. He reflected on Shrag's perceived lack of sagacity, hinting at a prior attempt to persuade the demons to retreat. Macht contemplated how the demon factions had diminished and might post the demon king's fall. The loss of a supreme unifier had rendered them aimless. He then made his return to Weiss, welcomed by the citizens' cheers and accolades. Later on, Gluck referenced Macht's willingness to serve as a magic tutor, inquiring about his proficiency in human magic, a rarity among demons. Macht informed him that he had acquired these skills from a demon named Solider, who similarly delved into human magic. When Gluck questioned Macht's familiarity with Soul Track, the predominant combat magic, Macht revealed that it was a formidable demon magic, innovated by an old acquaintance, and he boasted superior mastery over it compared to humans. Gluck, impressed by Macht's assertion, consented to his teaching role, coupling it with a new proposal. Gluck then led Macht to a church where Denken, a child of Gluck's late kin, victim to demonic attacks, was engaged in prayer. Gluck shared that Dinkin aspired to be a mage and had been close to Gluck's daughter. He instructed Mok to instruct Dinkin in magic as a distraction from his parents' demise. Mok, after confirming the command, committed to his role, waiting patiently outside the church. Upon Dinkin's departure, Mok introduced himself as the magic instructor for the Gluck lineage. Dinkin acknowledged Mok's role in repelling the demonic siege on Weiss, but expressed distrust towards Mok due to his kind's involvement in his parents' death. Mok, undeterred, stated that Dinkin's background made teaching him even more meaningful. Dinkin questioned Mok's strength, and Mok confidently affirmed his status as the most formidable amongst the seven sages of destruction. When Dinkin probed whether he could become strong enough to vanquish Mok, the demon replied with a smile, suggesting that the answer was not within his control. At the onset of a magic training session, Dinkin endeavored to perfect a long-range attack technique, aiming at a rock across a lake. Following an unsuccessful attempt, Macht recommended a pause, observing Dinkin's faltering focus. He reassured the youth that even demons found it challenging to strike such a distant target. This observation motivated Dinkin to intensify his efforts, and he successfully struck the target. Both Macht and Dinkin exchanged impressed smirks, with Dinkin conceding to take a break, coinciding with the arrival of Gluck and Lecture's carriage. During lunch, as Dinkin and Lecture engaged in conversation, Gluck and Macht observed the pair. Gluck expressed satisfaction with Dinkin's progress, but Macht noted Dinkin's persistent distrust towards him. Agreeing, Gluck remarked he would not have entrusted a relative's child to Macht otherwise, acknowledging the demon's adeptness and deception. Gluck reflected on the importance of a life purpose, even if rooted in vengeance, recognizing Dinkin's improved mental state compared to his days consumed by grief in the church. He found solace in Dinkin's newfound joy and instructed Macht to persist as both Dinkin's mentor and his ultimate adversary. Macht then inquired about Gluck's daughter's sentiments towards Dinkin, prompting Gluck to dismiss the possibility, asserting Mok's lack of understanding of human emotions. Over time, Mok diligently guided Dinkin in various aspects of magic, from mana control and theoretical knowledge to practical combat skills. Dinkin's prowess flourished, leading to his commendable military achievements. Concurrently, his bond with Lecture deepened, culminating in their marriage. Gluck later shared this news with Mok, noting the demon's atypical expression. Mock nonchalantly attributed his look to his usual demeanor, subtly hinting at his earlier prediction's accuracy. Gluck, somewhat dismissive, credited Dinkin's martial success, facilitated by Mock's tutelage, for the advantageous marriage, to which Mock humbly deferred, attributing it to Dinkin's own merit and capabilities. Gluck disclosed to Mock some disconcerting news. A northern fortified city had fallen victim to a lone demon's onslaught resulting in the annihilation of all inhabitants, with the perpetrator vanishing without leaving any clues. Inquiring if Macht had any insights into this incident, Gluck received a query in return from Macht, questioning if Gluck suspected him of involvement. Gluck dismissed such suspicions, 
but acknowledged the mounting public anxiety following the attack. Macht concurred, deducing that only a demon of significant power, akin to his own, could execute such a massacre. This development had incited the nobility of Weiss to pressure Gluck into taking decisive action against Macht. Pondering whether this meant his execution, Macht listened as Gluck revealed the stone bracelet of sovereignty. Macht, recognizing the bracelet crafted by Sage Uig, was taken aback by its actual existence. Gluck elaborated that the nobles, exploiting public fears, had rallied support for their plan to control Macht and harness his powers for immense wealth. The strategy involved obligating Macht to serve Weiss's populace, coupled with the bracelet as a safeguard against any malevolent actions. Gluck ridiculed the nobles' ignorance of demonic nature, questioning Macht's willingness to don the bracelet and accept death should he harbor malice. Macht's response, a smile followed by a question about accompanying Gluck to hell, indicated his readiness for this new amusement. With the bracelet in place, Macht's role as Gluck's attendant remained unaltered. He was present during Gluck's daughter's illness, demise, and subsequent funeral, where Gluck consoled a grieving Dan Kin, reassuring him of Lecture's happiness due to his presence in her life. Following these events, Dinkin departed from Weiss, not returning for many years. Meanwhile, Gluck adopted a routine of daily visits to his daughter's grave, a practice he continued diligently. During one of their regular visits to the grave, Gluck reflected on Dinkin's prolonged absence, reasoning that the loss of his wife, despite Dinkin's efforts to save her, must have been too burdensome. Mocked, accompanying him, cautioned Gluck against the toll of these repeated visits on his health, echoing Gluck's own advice from years past about the unhealthy nature of persistent sorrow. Gluck, with a hint of irony, expressed surprise at receiving such counsel from Macht. Struggling to rise, Gluck accepted Macht's assistance, acknowledging how he had aged to the point where depending on Macht had become commonplace. Macht offered to call a carriage, but Gluck, feeling inclined for a walk, declined. As they strolled back to the city, Gluck pondered aloud about Macht's unchanged demeanor over the past 30 years, attributing it to the temporal disparity between demons and humans. He mused whether their shared time was merely a fleeting moment for Macht. Macht solemnly responded, valuing their time together as something unique and irreplaceable. Gluck, with a wry smile, acknowledged feeling similarly, regarding Macht as an exceptional accomplice. Macht then unexpectedly initiated Diagals, aiming to annihilate everything he treasured, including Gluck. He expressed a belief that this act might enable him to comprehend malice and experience guilt. Gluck, confronting this revelation, nonchalantly prepared for his final cigarette, instructing Mock to light it. Mock, taken aback by Gluck's composed reaction, complied. Gluck, in his final moments, acknowledged his anticipation of such an outcome, having observed Mock for over three decades. He affirmed their bond as partners in crime and denounced Macht as an unrepentant villain destined for retribution. His last words, declaring their time together enjoyable, were met with Macht's agreement. In the wake of Gluck's transformation into gold, Macht unleashed his magic upon the entire city, converting the fortified city of Weiss into gold, sealing its fate instantaneously. Macht lingered in the now desolate fortified city of Weiss, days blurring together, haunted by the realization that he hadn't developed any new emotions despite violating the stone bracelet of sovereignty's command by destroying the city. Frustrated by his persistent life and the failure to achieve his emotional quest, Macht contemplated leaving Weiss, yet felt anchored by a sense of having touched upon an elusive understanding during the city's ruin. Determined to refine this newfound insight in future endeavors, he was preparing to depart when Siri unexpectedly confronted him. She demanded he restore the city, her sudden appearance catching Macht by surprise as he failed to sense her mana. Caught off guard, Macht inquired about Siri's identity, to which she reiterated her demand and critiqued his reckless endangerment of his own life. Despite Siri's insistence, Macht was unable to revert his catastrophic magic. Siri, with a hint of mockery, illuminated the crux of Macht's predicament, his inability to visualize humans emerging from gold a limitation stemming from his fundamental disconnect from human understanding. This revelation infuriated Macht, who, despite Ciri's evident threat to his life, attempted to cast his curse on her. His action backfired, with the curse adversely affecting his own hand, forcing him to hastily retreat from his own destructive magic. Macht, grappling with the realization that his magic had backfired on him, faced Ciri's assertion. 
She remarked that it mocked been more earnest in his attack. She could have reflected the entire curse onto him. Baffled by the deflection, Mocked questioned how such a feat was possible, given the complex nature of his Diagal's magic. Siri enlightened him about the Mistelzala spell she used, designed to rebound any perceived curse back to its originator. She described it as a testament to the ingenuity of ancient human mages, an unsophisticated yet potent magic that bypasses analytical understanding. Although it's a spell she personally dislikes, Siri noted its perfect suitability in countering Mokht's destructive capabilities. She then admonished Mokht for his excessive force in destroying Weiss. Inquiring again about Siri's identity, Mokht learned that she was a legendary great mage from a bygone era, a figure of terror even to demons. As he processed this revelation, Mokht undid the golden transformation on his hand and summoned his sword, swiftly attacking Siri. Siri, adept in spatial manipulation, deftly countered his strike. Marveling at Mokht's ability to reverse the gold transformation on objects but not on humans, she launched her own magical assault, which Mokht shielded himself from by transforming his cloak into a golden barrier. Siri observed Mokht's skill in manipulating his coat back from gold, taunting him for his failure to visualize transforming people back from their golden state. Despite his profound magical prowess, she pointed out, Mokht remained fundamentally a monster, unable to grasp the essence of human life and emotion. Mokht, visibly agitated by Siri's comment, brusquely told her to be silent. He rapidly reformed his sword and unleashed a series of soul tracks at Siri, who easily parried these with her defensive spells, followed by a powerful counterattack. When the dust cleared, Mokht was seen protected by a magical sphere, prompting Siri's curiosity at his proficiency in various magic types. She inquired about the next magic Mokht would showcase. However, their duel was abruptly interrupted by the arrival of a first-class mage, who encapsulated Mokht within a diminutive barrier. This intervention was overseen by Lernan. Both Mokht and Siri noted the disruption in their battle. Siri reprimanded her disciples for their unnecessary intrusion, having instructed them to remain as sentinels. Lernan reasoned with Siri, arguing that eliminating Mokht at that juncture would mean the loss of the Diagal's magic and, consequently, any hope of restoring Weiss. Despite Siri's reservations about Mokht's formidable power and potential threat, Lernan persisted, suggesting they contain Mokht within Weiss until a solution for the curse was found, irrespective of the time it might take. Siri, though skeptical, acquiesced to this plan, disinterestedly permitting them to proceed as they saw fit. Lernan expressed his gratitude and, alongside other first-class mages, began constructing the Great Barrier of El Dorado. Back in the current time, Dinkin and Freeran had concluded their review of Mok's memories. The exhaustive process had significantly drained Freeran's mana, leaving her nearly incapacitated. Fern stepped in to assist her, to which Freeran humorously remarked that Fern would now have to attend to her daily needs, as she typically does. Fern's response was interrupted when she detected an immense surge of mana. At the barrier's boundary, Solidar appeared, announcing that it was time to unravel the mysteries of the Great Barrier of El Dorado. While Dankin was busy preparing a meal outside the Warden's residence, Fern mentioned to him that she briefly detected a significant surge of mana, though she speculated it could have been an error in perception. Dankin acknowledged this possibility, noting that the nature of undetectable curses often leads to inaccuracies in mana sensing. Nonetheless, he remained cautious, suggesting that if Fern's detection was accurate, they might be dealing with a shrewd adversary who chose the perfect moment to approach El Dorado, when Freeran was most vulnerable. Freeran concurred, admitting her current inability to discern such presences near El Dorado. Dankin suggested conducting a patrol later and inquired about specific details, but Fern had no further information to provide. During this conversation, Fern was tenderly feeding Freeran the freshly cooked meal. Freeran requested Fern to cool the food by blowing on it which Fern obligingly did. Stark, observing this interaction, commented that Fern was pampering Freeran excessively. In response, Freeran teasingly asked if Stark was envious. He quickly refuted the suggestion, but Fern, with a playful gesture, handed him the spoon and proposed they take turns feeding Freeran. Denkin chimed in, reminding them to include vegetables in Freeran's diet as well. Stark, now assuming the role of caregiver, quizzically asked Freer and if she was feigning laziness. 
In response, Freer asserted she was diligently engaged in processing the vast trove of memories acquired from Mott, thus deserving more pampering. Fern concurred and coaxed Freer into eating her vegetables, despite her apparent reluctance. Stark, seizing the opportunity, urged Fern to persist with the less favored greens. He then inquired about the duration of the memory analysis, to which Freer estimated two months. Both Stark and Fern expressed their dismay, but Dinkin intervened, highlighting that such a timeline was remarkably swift. He had initially anticipated a time frame of up to three years for the analysis. Acknowledging their sacrifice of time, Dinkin apologized for the delay in their journey. Stark and Fern reassured him, indicating that such deviations were commonplace in their travels with Freeran. Due to the Spartan amenities of the Warden's house, lacking even basic comforts like a bed, Stark and Dinkin agreed to move to a nearby settlement for the duration of the analysis. Meanwhile, Freeran, unable to finish her meal, apologized to a visibly irritated Fern who expressed her annoyance through the way she braided Freeran's hair. Stark remarked on the telltale nature of Fern's braiding style when upset, a detail that surprised Dankin. Elsewhere, at the edge of the Great Barrier of El Dorado, Mocked encountered Solitaire. Despite the barrier's obstruction to sound, Solitaire spoke, reminiscing about their past meeting and observing that Mocked couldn't hear her. She continued, mentioning that Freeran had commenced the analysis of Mocked's memories. While Mocked seemed indifferent to this development, Solitaire warned of Freeran's capabilities as a formidable mage, one of the rare individuals capable of vanquishing him. She expressed her intention to observe the conclusion of Mocked's long-held dream of human-demon coexistence, a narrative she believed was destined for a tragic finale. Solitaire, standing close to the barrier, expressed her resolve to assist Mocked. Despite her belief that Mocked would not be defeated by humans, she admitted to her own fear and hesitation towards mankind, highlighting her lack of confidence to underestimate them. Upon touching the barrier, she immediately realized why even a being as powerful as Mocked couldn't dismantle it. The Great Barrier, a collaborative creation by numerous human sorcerers, incorporated diverse theories of human magic from various countries, making it virtually indecipherable to demons without extensive knowledge of human magic. Solitaire, an outlier who had delved into human magical studies, began her analysis of the barrier, estimating it would take her about two months to complete. Throughout this, Mock's reaction remained neutral, neither optimistic nor pessimistic about the outcome. During the two months, Dinkin, Freeran, and their companions maintained their daily activities in the nearby town, regularly patrolling El Dorado's outskirts for any potential ambushers. Despite their efforts, no threats were uncovered. As Freeran approached the completion of her analysis, Solitaire finalized hers, identifying key components of the Great Barrier, such as the Calm Race's Demon Seals, the Andrew Barrier Theory, and the Isolation Great Barrier. She appreciated the barrier as a masterful work, almost regretting its destruction. Meanwhile, in the town, Din Kin and Stark visited Fern for an update on Fern's progress. Fern predicted the analysis would conclude in two more days. Suddenly, she sensed a powerful mana surge, similar to the one she had detected previously. As the Great Barrier of El Dorado began to crumble amidst the seismic vibrations, Mocked, seated by a fountain in the city, glanced at the Bracelet of Sovereignty. With the barrier now broken, Solitaire proclaimed the initiation of the battle, one that she deemed pivotal for the pursuit of coexistence. Upon observing the disintegration of the barrier, Dankin senses a demon presence matching Mocked's mana levels and acknowledges Mocked's newfound freedom. As they watch Mocked's golden transmutation expand, Dinkin, Fern, and Stark initiate an evacuation. Meanwhile, Solitaire approaches Mocked and Weiss, noting his ongoing quest for emotions he hasn't yet found. Despite his shortcomings, she expresses an interest in assisting Mocked to prove the impossibility of coexistence between demons and humans. Mocked responds with ambivalence to her proposition. As they journey away from Weiss in a wagon, with Freer in his sleep, Fern detects the demon responsible for the barrier's destruction. Realizing the potential danger posed to the larger group, Fern and Stark decide to confront the demon themselves, entrusting the safety of the civilians and Freer into Dankin. During their pursuit, they encounter Solitaire, who prefers dialogue over conflict. Introducing herself as the great demon Solitaire, she piques Fern and Stark's interest, as neither is familiar with her name. 
Fern remembers Freeran's caution regarding encounters with nameless great demons, aware that encounters with such beings often end fatally, with no survivors to recount the experience. Stark readies himself to confront Solitaire, but the demon asserts she has led a secluded life without ever killing anyone. However, both Fern and Stark are skeptical, sensing a deathly aura from her. In response, Fern launches a soul track attack, which Solitaire effortlessly counters with her defensive magic, surprising Fern with her proficiency in human magic. Intrigued by Fern's skills, Solitaire bombards her with questions, but Fern, ignoring the inquiries, prepares for another offensive. Her casting is abruptly halted when a massive, triangular sword impales her shoulder. As Stark rushes to assist Fern, the sky becomes inundated with similar swords. Solitaire warns that she'll sever their arms if they persist in their assault, but Stark, undeterred, deflects one of the airborne swords, urging Fern to escape. Solitaire, admiring their bravery in the face of palpable fear and her relentless onslaught, expresses a desire to learn more about humanity through their actions. After Fern and Stark depart to confront the demon, Dinkin informs the remaining civilians of his decision to stay behind and face mocked. He advises them to escort Freer into the Empire, a region where even Mocked would encounter difficulties. The civilians express their best wishes to Dinkin before departing with Freer. Subsequently, Dinkin encounters Mocked, who expresses his desire to leave his old abode and eliminate everyone who knows of his existence for a new beginning. Mocked views Freer as an obstacle in this plan and intends to pursue her. Dinkin interjects, stating he still clings to the slim hope that Mokht can revert El Dorado to its original state, despite Mokht's inability to reverse his magic. Despite his respect for Mokht as a former mentor, Dinkin acknowledges Mokht's danger to humanity and readies himself for battle. Mokht questions Dinkin's sanity upon hearing his bold declaration. Dinkin explains his hesitation to confront Mokht stemmed not from fear or lack of confidence, but from a faint hope for a more amicable resolution. Dinkin then accepts the possibility of defeating Mokht, stating his preparedness and willingness to try despite the odds. As Mokht releases his formidable mana, Dinkin, recognizing the vast disparity in their powers, admits it's been some time since he's felt such a proximity to death. Nonetheless, he believes in a potential future where he emerges victorious. Mokht remarks on Dinkin's persistent obstinacy in the face of overwhelming odds. In their magical confrontation, Mokht compares the battle to their past training sessions, expressing admiration for Duncan's advanced techniques and improved responsiveness. Duncan skillfully counters Mokht's moves, showcasing his significant growth since their training days. Mokht, impressed by Duncan's prowess, acknowledges his former pupil's capabilities. As Mokht prepares for a decisive strike, realizing the urgency to intercept Freern before she enters the Empire's territory, a sudden shift occurs. Mokht unexpectedly begins to transmute into gold, mirroring the effects of his own magic. This surprising change is due to Duncan's deployment of the curse reversal magic, Mistel's Law, enveloping him in a dark aura. Overwhelmed by this transformation, Mokht recognizes and commends Duncan's strategic application of the powerful magic. Following the completion of the first class mage exam, Dinkin is given the liberty to select any magic he desires by Siri. He opts for the curse reversal magic, Mistel's Law, a choice that prompts Siri to question its appeal, considering it somewhat mundane. Dinkin leaves the question unanswered. Siri acknowledges his selection, noting the considerable time, a hundred years, usually required to master such magic, a feat nearly unattainable for humans. Utilizing spell transfer magic, Fiervelia, Siri encapsulates both the magic and her century of learning into a grimoire, which she then bestows upon Dinkin. He reflects on the nature of Siri's gifts, realizing they represent the time she invested in learning them, essentially parts of her life. Since, present at the scene, raises a concern that Siri would lose her ability to counteract curses through reversal by passing the magic to Dinkin. Siri, however, dismisses this concern citing her alternative defensive strategies and the triviality of relearning the magic in her lifespan. She reaffirms the absolute value of any magic she imparts. Siri cautions Dankin about the substantial mana demand of Mistel's Law, equating it to the consumption of an omnidirectional defense spell, and emphasizes the need for precise timing in its use due to this high demand. Dankin assures her he understands the strategic importance of this timing. In the present moment, 
Dankin confidently states his awareness of when Mokht will employ his curse magic, thanks to his years of observing Mokht as his minor. He notes that Mokht possesses the ability to revert from a gold state back to his original form. As Mokht gradually frees himself from the gold transformation, Dankin declares they are ready for another round of combat. Despite their wounds, Fern and Stark persist in their combat efforts, launching attacks at Solidar, who easily deflects them. In the midst of the fight, Solidar shares her fascination with human life, expressing particular interest in their familial relationships, a concept alien to demon society. She elaborates on her curiosity about human dreams, aspirations, and the poignant words they speak at life's end. These facets of human existence, she explains, are integral to her research and captivate her deeply. Stark, growing weary of her monologue, launches an aggressive attack, only to be met with a fierce counterattack from Solidar, who vows to continue her assault until he can no longer stand. Meanwhile, Fern manages to surprise Solidar by breaching her defenses and inflicting damage to her arm using an unusually swift soul track. Solidar, taken aback by Fern's speed, inquires about the nature of the spell used, but Fern chooses not to respond and instead unleashes a barrage of soul tracks aimed at Solidar, resulting in a series of powerful explosions. However, when the dust settles, Fern realizes that despite the direct hits, Solidar remains largely unaffected. She concludes that the sheer magnitude of Solidar's mana, stemming from the vast difference in lifespans between humans and demons, is overwhelming her magic. Solidar acknowledges Fern's unique rapid-fire version of Soul Track, expressing her appreciation for experiencing such a distinct form of magic. In a display of her own abilities, she inflicts multiple cuts on Stark and Fern using her Mana Strike, a straightforward yet potent magic. Despite her attempt to assure them that her intention is only to converse and not to kill them outright, Fern responds with a powerful blast to Solidar's shoulder. Fern deduces that by intensifying the concentration of her magical energy, her attacks can impact the demon. Solidar acknowledges the near-critical hit from Fern, admiring her for her precision, keen observational skills, and the ability to maintain attack velocity while enhancing the potency of her magic, even in the face of injuries. Suddenly, their encounter is interrupted by Mocked Diagold's magic, which turns Stark and Fern into gold. Solidar expresses regret at the abrupt end to their combat. Meanwhile, Dankin engages in a tense battle with Mokht, who points out that Duncan's curse reversal magic, Mistilziela, hinges on his ability to anticipate when Diagolds will be deployed. Mokht highlights the limitation of this strategy, stating that the magic's efficacy will diminish with his continuous casting of the curse. He queries Dankin about the duration he can sustain the fight, contrasting it with his own endurance to continue for days. Acknowledging the formidable nature of his opponent, Dankin swiftly takes to flight, realizing the urgency of preventing Freerin and the others from succumbing to Mokht's gold transmutation. Internally, Dankin acknowledges his responsibility for involving Freerin and her companions in this perilous situation and is determined to save Freerin from the gold spread. Estimating a narrow window of 12 seconds to reach her at his maximum speed, Solidar intercepts Dankin during his escape, challenging him to provide some parting words. In a desperate maneuver to evade her impending attack, Dankin deactivates his Mistal Zila, which results in his own transformation into gold just as Solidar's blades are about to strike him. Observing Dankin's sacrifice, Solidar acknowledges his stature as a formidable mage. As gold encases Dankin's face, he silently offers his apologies to Freerin and her companions. In the aftermath, where Gold now dominates the landscape, Solidar rejoins Mokht. She expresses her disappointment in the situation, finding it lackluster. Mokht responds, indicating that tedium is a familiar and frequent experience for them. Reflecting on a recent discovery, Solidar shares with Mokht her observations at the site of Aura's defeat by Freerin. There, she detected residual mana indicating that Freerin had effectively neutralized Osirlis. She further explains that Freerin had been closely studying Aura's magic for the 80 years Aura had been confronting the hero party. Mokht expresses skepticism regarding Solidar's assertion that Freerin could decipher the magic of one of the Seven Sages of Destruction. However, Solidar counters this skepticism by arguing that, although the core principles of the Sage's magic may be inscrutable due to the nature of demon magic and their biological attributes, 
This doesn't preclude the possibility of their magic being dispelled by humans. She draws parallels to human ingenuity in areas like maritime navigation, where humans have managed to construct and navigate boats and sails without a comprehensive understanding of buoyancy, wind, and waves. In essence, humans have a knack for devising practical solutions to unknown problems purely through observation and experimentation. Realizing the implications of Solider's argument, Macht considers the ongoing analysis of his memories by Freerin and ponders the frequency of his use of diagolds. Solider concludes their conversation by reminding Macht that their confrontation with Freerin, whom she refers to as Freerin the Slayer, is far from over. Freerin reminisces about an incident with the previous hero party, where they found themselves confined within a barrier set by the immortal Bose, one of the seven sages of destruction. Once they realized their situation, Freerin informed Himmel that their escape efforts were in vain and their journey had come to an end. Himmel, unfazed, challenged Freerin's resignation by highlighting the power of visualization and realizing magic, questioning her plan in the event of their surrender. Freerin differentiated between giving up and the inability to visualize magic, using the analogy of crushing a walnut versus a diamond with one's hand. She explained that while Himmel could easily crush a walnut, he would internally doubt his ability to do the same with a diamond, a task seemingly beyond human capability. Eisen interjected, claiming he could crush a diamond, but Freerin pointed out her own limitations in comparison to Bose, rendering her unable to break the barrier. Inspired by Freerin's explanation, Himmel rose to action, his resolve unshaken, and declared that he would help Freerin visualize the impossible. He struck the barrier with his sword, creating a small chip, demonstrating to Freerin that the barrier wasn't entirely unbreakable. Aizen also readied himself to join the assault on the barrier. Moved by her companion's determination, Freerin began to channel her magic. She expressed uncertainty about the time required to break through, but Hyder supported her with a spell that could sustain them for two months. Freerin humorously observed the uniqueness of her party members, considering them all to be extraordinary beings. In the present day, Freerin awakens and successfully neutralizes the transmutation magic surrounding her. Reflecting on her analysis of Mach's memories, she confidently announces that Diagolds will no longer pose a threat as a curse, indicating her newfound understanding and mastery over it. A younger Dankin is gently awakened by Lecture, and he apologizes for dozing off. Lecture observes his new badge, congratulating him on his advancement. Dankin reflects on how the reward from his promotion would have been sufficient for them to live comfortably, potentially averting Lecture's demise. However, he soon realizes he's dreaming. In the dream, he shares with Lecture that the night he received his badge, the eve of his planned return home, he was informed of her passing, missing the chance to be with her in her final moments. Grateful for the dream reunion, he informs her about Mach's triumph. Contemplating his inferiority to his former master, Lecture's encouragement revives a memory of a training session where Dang Kin had once managed to wound Mok. In reality, Freerin neutralizes Diagolds, freeing Dang Kin. She informs him that only an hour has elapsed and casts a protective spell to shield them from Diagold's effects. As they traverse the gold-transformed forest, Mok and Solitaire quickly locate them, despite Freerin's efforts to hide their mana. Mok expresses his surprise at Freerin's ability to dispel Diagolds, viewing it as a threat he cannot overlook. Upon meeting, Solitaire introduces herself, and Freer assesses her as a formidable demon, comparable in strength to Macht. Solitaire remarks on Freerin's rapid analysis and dispelling of Diagolds, which Freerin attributes to an encounter with Macht six centuries ago, an event Macht himself does not recall. Freerin recounts how it took her a century to restore her right arm, turned to gold in their battle. Macht realizes Freerin had tried to provoke him into using Diagolds and wise to refine her negation spell. Surprised by her daring strategy, he acknowledges the imperfection of Diagolds, susceptible to spells like Mistelzyla. Freerin explains that by visualizing magic's properties, she built a theoretical negation spell from his memories, enabling the restoration of the Golden Land. Macht and Solitaire are hit by Freerin's flames. Solitaire suggests Freerin and Dankin retreat considering their formidable foes. Freerin refuses, fearing the consequences of Mok's freedom, and challenges Mok's intention for human coexistence. She references the Demon King's similar aspiration, which led to massive human casualties. Questioning how many more lives Mok's dream would cost, Freerin declares her retribution. 
mocked, recalling Gluck's final words before his gold transmutation, accepts her challenge. Dinkin asks Freerin to leave mock to him. She agrees, turning her attention to an enthusiastic Solitaire for a showdown. Freerin employs her defensive magic to fend off Solitaire's sword attacks, noting they've drifted from El Dorado and separated from Dinkin. Despite her powerful Wolzamble, Hell's Inferno spell, Solitaire remains unscathed, indicating her formidable strength. Freerin contemplates that even if they hadn't split, she had no plans to assist Dinkin. Solitaire, acknowledging her cautious nature, admits to choosing the most likely path to victory. She expresses surprise at human superior coordination skills but criticizes Freerin for being heartless, suggesting Dinkin might perish at Mach's hands. While defending against Solitaire's assault, Freerin counters, asserting Demon's failure to understand human thought. She had seen determination in Dinkin's eyes, leading her to trust him to watch her back. Freerin launches an attack with Judra Jalim, destructive lightning, resolved to obliterate the great demon Solitor. Solitor, however, maintains that Dinkin is no match for Macht, one of the seven sages of destruction. She asserts Macht's invincibility against a human mage, even without Diagals. However, she reconsiders, recognizing that demons often succumb due to their arrogance and oversight, explaining their frequent defeats despite being predators. She admits demons have yet to learn the essence of being prey. Concluding her thoughts, Solitaire retracts her blades, expressing a wish for a more relaxed conversation with Freerin. She decides that her best course of action is to exert full force to defeat Freerin, then assist Macht if necessary. Freerin experiences a sudden shift in the mana flow and is hit by a powerful spell from Solitaire. Despite its simplicity, Solitaire's spell effectively blasts away mana, making it a lethal method for killing a person. Freerin, although gravely injured, remains resilient. Solitor understands that opponents with significant mana, like Freerin, are incredibly tough, necessitating relentless attacks to incapacitate them. Freerin acknowledges that their mana levels are relatively similar, yet Solitor's mastery over mana control is almost otherworldly. Her attacks, while monotonous, penetrate Freerin's defense magic with overwhelming force, rendering it almost useless. Freerin realizes she cannot endure continuous attacks of such intensity and that a direct hit could be instantly fatal. Additionally, Freerin is troubled by Solitaire's nearly impenetrable defensive wall, equally dense and robust, effectively neutralizing most of Freerin's offensive spells. Solitaire's ability to manipulate mana with such precision and stability, without any incantation, defies all known principles of magic. After sustaining a powerful blow, Freerin falls to the ground, overwhelmed by the sheer force of Solitaire's magic. Freerin detests facing nameless great demons like Solitaire, recognizing the impending danger of being overpowered. Solitaire urges Freerin to unleash her full power, having deduced from her battle with Aura that Freerin is consciously restraining her mana. Solitaire notes the absence of any fluctuations in Freerin's mana that would indicate restriction, acknowledging that without prior investigation, she might have overlooked Freerin's subtle control. Solitaire expresses her amazement at Freerin's advanced level of skill, noting that such mastery is not attainable through mere centuries of training. She suspects it must have involved a grueling journey marked by considerable struggle and pain. Freerin, growing tired of Solitaire's verbose nature, labels her as overly talkative. Despite her injuries, Freerin gathers her strength and rises, determined to defeat Solitaire then and there. Solitaire observes that Fern also possesses adeptness and mana restriction, but doubts its effectiveness against great demons at her current level. Freerin, intrigued, inquires if Solitor has encountered Fern and the others. Solitor confirms, attributing her shoulder wound to Fern's skill. Solitor acknowledges that Freerin's comrades exhibit impressive coordination, likely a result of rigorous training. Freerin feels a sense of pride, realizing that Fern has matured significantly. She surmises that Fern and Stark have likely been transformed into gold statues However, Solitaire reveals she has already killed both Fern and Stark. Freerin reflects on Solitaire's revelation, puzzled why her companions didn't flee upon encountering a great demon as instructed. In a swift move, Solitaire appears behind Freerin, but this gives Freerin an opportunity to land a direct hit on Solitaire's chest. Using a technique similar to Solitaire's, Freerin delivers a powerful blow. She remarks that the spell is indeed simple, enabling her to replicate it effectively. 
both Freerun and Solider are wounded in the midst of their intense battle. Despite her injuries, Solider is laughing, clearly enjoying the fight. She remarks that, despite her extensive experiences and conversations, this might be her first true battle to the death. Unfazed, she advances towards Freerin and launches an attack. The battle rages on, with both combatants unleashing powerful spells. Solider remains thoroughly entertained, even as Freerin drops to her knees, analyzing her situation. Freerin realizes that her attacks are not deep enough to penetrate Solider's formidable magical defenses and acknowledges the futility of trying to overpower such a monstrous foe in a battle of brute force. Solider comments that their battle will become a war of attrition if it continues in this manner. She attempts to engage Freerin in conversation, offering to share insights. However, Freerin quickly dismisses her, stating that Solider talks excessively, and it's a waste of time. Still, Freerin concedes that allowing Solider to speak might buy her some time to strategize. Solider confesses her respect for human wisdom, courage, and the collective evolution of their magical techniques. She admits that she does not underestimate mankind and envisions a day when she might plead for her life. Solider expresses that if today were that day and Freerin were to judge her, she wants to understand her current mindset. Solider then apologizes and promises to change her ways, stating that her desire was to befriend humans, but she never knew how. Freerin responds unimpressed, noting she has heard such claims countless times before. Solider then suggests that Freerin's perspective might be significantly different from that of most humans, pointing out that despite encountering beings who look human, speak human languages, and beg for mercy, Freerin has consistently slain them without lending an ear to their pleas. Solider starts questioning whether she or Freerin is the real monster, given Freerin's stoic demeanor. Solider finds this intriguing and prompts Freerin to share her current state of mind. Freerin recognizes that this isn't a genuine conversation but rather an analysis. She acknowledges that Solider understands human psychology better than any other demon she has encountered, but emphasizes that demons are far from being able to coexist with humans. Freerin compares Solider's actions to someone poking a caged animal to observe its reactions. When Solider inquires again about Freerin's thoughts, Freerin confesses that facing a brutal demon like Solider is comforting as it allows her to resolve the conflict without any guilt. Meanwhile, Duncan continues his combat with Macht. Macht observes that Duncan's attacks are becoming increasingly precise, and he's predicting more of Macht's moves. Macht notes that Duncan's combat style has evolved quickly, realizing that Duncan is recalling his movements. However, Macht recognizes the significant difference in their strengths, understanding that the longer the battle continues, the more it benefits him. Denkin reflects on his situation, realizing that despite his powerful magic, none of his advanced techniques are impacting Mott, reminiscent of their encounters half a century ago. Yet, he recalls one exception. Denkin successfully lands a soul track spell on Mott, surprising both himself and Mott with its speed. Denkin credits his success to the insights Freerin had previously shared with him. During the mage exam, Freerin explains that soul track, a common offensive magic, is relatively new to her, given her long lifespan. Since it hasn't been around long enough to become instinctive for her to defend against, there's a slight delay in her reaction time, a critical moment that requires conscious thought. In the present, Duncan successfully hits Mocked with Soul Track. Despite Mocked's superior status, Soul Track is still a recent development for him, whereas human mages have been familiar with it since birth. Moreover, Macht is unaware of the extensive research on soul track conducted by humans over the past 50 years, as well as the advancements in defense magic designed specifically to counter it. Duncan's attacks effectively penetrate Macht's defenses. Macht is frustrated by the evolution of soul track, which has transformed from the simple offensive magic he once knew. Duncan notes that soul track is often considered a basic attack spell, suggesting they conclude their battle. Mokt acknowledges that his opponent represents the culmination of human magical development. He agrees to end their fight, recognizing that he is both Dinkin's former master and the adversary he must now defeat. Mokt admits to feeling intrigued, an emotion he hasn't experienced in a long time. Mokt, affirming his role as Dinkin's adversary, introduces himself as Mokt of El Dorado, a member of the Demon King army and one of the Seven Sages of Destruction. He launches a massive attack, unlike any he has used before, utilizing countless flakes of gold. 
Deng Kin realizes the severity of the situation, understanding that a direct hit from this attack could annihilate him. Despite his best efforts, Deng Kin struggles to land a hit on Macht. A strike from Macht grazes Duncan's shoulder, shattering his defensive magic and showcasing Macht's extraordinary power that goes beyond conventional offensive magic. Contemplating the extent of Macht's dedication to mastering such formidable magic, Duncan acknowledges that this level of power is beyond what any human mage could aspire to achieve. It epitomizes the formidable nature of the Seven Sages of Destruction. As he removes a gold flake from his shoulder, Duncan resolves to continue the fight for as long as he lives. He faces difficulty in predicting Macht's movements using mana detection, finding it too slow to react post-attack. To compensate, Duncan calms himself, focusing intently to not miss any of Macht's preparatory motions, believing that he can at least manage that. He reminds himself that Freer entrusted him to protect her, fueling his determination to defeat Macht. Macht, observing Duncan's unwavering resolve, expresses admiration for his determination to persevere. Back in the midst of their confrontation, Solider observes Freer maintaining a distance and speculates whether she is attempting to buy time with this strategy. However, Freerin offers no response, instead choosing to cast Soul Track. Solider recognizes this spell as a widely adored and effective offensive magic among humans, remarking on its generic yet superior nature. She notes its flaw lies in its beautifully crafted incantation, which has become so accessible that it now stands as a cornerstone of human magic, responsible for numerous wartime casualties in the southern countries. Solider expresses her awareness of the Elder Sage of Corruption Qual's demise, surprising Freerin. She explains her knowledge stems from her enjoyment of conversing with people, many of whom have recounted tales about Qual, possibly some that Freerin is familiar with. During this exchange, Freerin notices Solider employing a typical demonic tactic of provoking agitation through words. Although these words compel one to seek their meaning, Freerin finds this approach primitive yet effective in battle, recognizing Solider as a master of this art. She reflects on the numerous lives Solider must have taken to satiate her learning. Furthermore, Solider dismisses the idea that Freerin's tactics will grant her any significant advantage, stating that while demons may lack a deep understanding of human magic, they are not so ignorant as to be unable to comprehend the structure of incantations. She asserts that the human-adopted soul track won't take her long to analyze. Solider warns Freerin that if she intends to confront her effectively, she must act swiftly. Concurrently, Denkin and Freerin engage in their respective battles. Solider comments that Freerin couldn't possibly reach her, to which Freerin concedes. However, she is continuously troubled by Solider's existing shoulder wound. Seizing this opportunity, Freerin targets the wound with a highly concentrated soul track. Solider, unfazed, remarks that she is already familiar with this spell. Freerin realizes Solider has used a mana shield and is astounded by her exceptionally quick reaction time. As Freerin contemplates her strategy, she notes that Solider's action to block the wound indicates it's a viable target, suggesting that exploiting a gap after an attack might be effective. This would require greater speed, and Freerin momentarily wishes for Fern's assistance, reflecting on how much easier it would be with her help. Solider previously claimed to have killed both Fern and Stark, and Freerin has no grounds to dismiss this as a falsehood, given Solider's immense power. However, Freerin knows there's no time for worry. Recalling Himmel's trust in his comrades to cover his back until the very end, she decides it's time to take a similar gamble. During the intensification of their battle, Dankin finds himself still capable of reacting to and observing Macht with a sense of calm, much to his own astonishment. Facing Macht, a mage of unparalleled power who seems to operate on a transcendental level, part of Dankin is surprised to find that Macht has not exceeded his expectations. In his memories, Macht has always been an insurmountable figure, leading Dankin to believe victory was out of reach. Yet, in the heat of the moment, he dares to believe otherwise. Unexpectedly, Macht lands a strike on Dankin with his weapon, prompting Dankin to hope for at least a stalemate. Despite the severe blow, Duncan's determination remains unshaken, even as Macht announces the end of the battle in his favor. Simultaneously, as Freerin is locked in combat with Solider, the curse that had enveloped El Dorado is lifted, restoring everything to its original state, including the villagers. 
This unforeseen turn of events takes Mokt by surprise, momentarily diverting his attention and providing Dan Ken with an opportunity to unleash a potent soul track. Mokt is taken aback by his lapse in concentration and questions why Dan Ken reserves such a powerful spell until that moment. Dan Ken responds by echoing Mokt's own teachings, stating that a trump card should be played only once. With respect, he addresses Mokt as master and proposes that their battle concludes in a draw. Freerin announces she has completed her analysis of El Dorado, ensuring its restoration to normalcy. Solider is taken aback, realizing Freerin continued her analysis amidst their duel. Solider's realization deepens when she understands Freerin anticipated Fern's assistance. From a distance, the first class mage strikes Solider, earning Freerin's commendation. Yet, Fern's mana depletes, leading Stark to support her. Solider is caught off guard by the attack its origin beyond her mana detection capabilities. Despite her prone position, Solider marvels at the turn of events. A flashback reveals a confrontation between Himmel's party and the immortal Bose, where Himmel criticizes Bose for underestimating humans, pinpointing his failure to recognize their potential. Solider, reflecting on her mistake, questions whether Freerin expects her to plead for mercy. Freerin, uninterested in such pleas, decisively ends the battle, securing her triumph. With the conflict resolved, Freerin surmises that Dan Ken, too, have managed without her intervention. Following the conclusion of their evenly matched duel, Dan Ken collapses to the ground, while Mokt, bearing a chest wound, contemplates his next move, given Freerin's survival. Venturing around a corner, Mokt is taken aback to find the villagers restored to their original states. One of them inquires about his injury, to which he assures them he's fine. As he continues his walk, Mokt comes to the realization that Solider has perished. He reminisces about a conversation they had, questioning why she aided him despite viewing coexistence as an unattainable dream. Solider had reason she thought perhaps she could sway his perspective. Mokt and the great demon king shared similar aspirations for coexistence, yet this very desire catalyzed a devastating war with humanity. Solider had expressed no pleasure in such outcomes, lamenting the loss of their comrades as well. She deemed the pursuit of coexistence perilous. Mock suggested that it would be simpler for Solider to eliminate him than to alter his stance. Solider then admitted her true motive was to end his life, albeit hindered by her reluctance to engage him in combat. She confessed her lack of courage to jeopardize her existence for the sake of their race's future, emphasizing their inherent demonic nature despite varying appearances. To Solider, acknowledging the shared demonic essence was sufficient. From the moment Mokt was bound by the stone bracelet of sovereignty, he never entertained the fear of death. Yet, in the face of his current predicament, he finds himself clinging to life, fleeing in a manner he once deemed beneath him. Lost in thought about his uncertain future and acknowledging his irreversible choices, Mokt unexpectedly encounters Gluck. Respectfully, Mokt greets his former master, who inquires about his injury. Mokt soberly admits it's time for his retribution. Gluck, lighting a cigarette, offers one to Mokt and assists him in lighting it. Mokt reflects on his failure to grasp any profound understanding through his actions. Gluck expresses regret, recalling his promise to stand by Mokt until he came to understand guilt and malice. Yet, he insists those were sincere words, which Mokt accepts. At that moment, Dankin approaches, determined as ever. Mokt, observing Denkin's resolve, cautions him against coming closer, threatening Gluck's life. Gluck, acknowledging his own irredeemability, implores Denkin to end his suffering. Following Gluck's request, Denkin takes action. Shortly after, reinforcements arrive, and Gluck directs them to escort Denkin to the church, emphasizing his role as Weiss's savior. With a final nod to his partner in crime, Gluck conveys his fondness for the time spent together, marking a poignant goodbye. Denkin regains consciousness in a strange location, only to be informed by a priest that he is in the Weiss church and has been unconscious for three days. When Gluck visits, he shares that Freerin has recounted the entire ordeal to him. He expresses surprise at Duncan's half-century-long journey back to Weiss and praises him for his role in saving the city. However, Denkin attributes the success to the invaluable support of his allies, a sentiment Gluck echoes, acknowledging the exceptional companionship Denkin has had. In another part of the city, Stark is seen resuming his usual training regimen under Fern's watchful eye. Engaging in a lighthearted exchange, 
Stark downplays the severity of being shattered to pieces, likening it to a common warrior's experience. Yet, when Fern and Freeran share a private joke, Stark protests against their whispering, prompting Freeran to humorously compare his resilience to Aizen's, who would have been performing squats with a boulder the day after a similar injury. With Stark up and about, Freeran delegates tomorrow's shopping duties to him, noting Fern's need for further recovery. She reminisces about Weiss's past reputation as a hub for grimoires and magical wares, showcasing a darkness dragon horn she recently acquired, a rare find that brings her visible joy. Despite Fern's chiding over financial imprudence, Stark is taken aback by the artifact's ominous aura. As Freeran departs, she commends Stark and Fern for their indispensable contribution to her triumph, affirming that their support was crucial to her success. Having recuperated, the group took to exploring the city of Weiss. Freeran indulged in shopping, while Fern and Stark returned to their usual routines of reading and training. After savoring their time in the city, the party made preparations to depart, making sure to visit Denkin and Gluck for a final farewell. Freeran observed it was time they moved on after a sufficient rest. Gluck shared that their departure coincided with the upcoming arrival of an envoy from the royal capital, a time when the misdeeds of Weiss's nobility would be exposed, including his own. Despite his involvement, Gluck appeared content, explaining his request to Dankin to use his position as an influential imperial mage to bring justice. He expressed his joy at seeing the wheels of justice turning and extended his gratitude to Freeran for her pivotal role in supporting Dankin towards victory. Aware of Freeran's insight into his memories, Gluck expressed no bitterness towards Mock's demise, considering it a fitting conclusion. He acknowledged that without Freeran's intervention to reverse El Dorado, Mock's end might have been far more somber. Prepared to see them off and suggest summoning Dankin, Gluck was informed by Freeran that Dankin had already visited his late wife's grave and they had bid him farewell. In solitude, Dankin reflected on his tumultuous efforts and cherished the memories of Weiss when his wife was alive, acknowledging the struggle but cherishing the moments they shared. As Freeran and her companions resumed their journey, they left Weiss behind, each carrying their experiences and the impact of their actions with them into their ongoing adventure.